I want to jump quickly into the Word of God. I want to move quickly this morning. If you have your Bible, and remain standing just for a moment. I want to read this passage of Scripture. Exodus chapter 14 and verse 4. And this morning, I'm going to be using the New Living Translation to tell a story. Uh, this translation brings out to me the storytelling aspect and language that's very understandable and easy to follow. In Exodus 14.4, says, and once again, this is God talking to Moses, the leader of the Israelite people. Once again, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after you. I have planned this in order to display my glory through Pharaoh and his whole army. After this, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites camped there as they were told. For the past several weeks in Anthem Student Ministries, we've been talking about how to overcome depression, anxiety, these things of our mind that trap us in our situations. And uh, I've paralleled these places we face in our lives to a desert. Deserts are barren, nothing growing, extreme in climate, and seemingly endless. And this morning, I believe there are many people in this very room facing or walking through or stuck in deserts in your own life, a situation that seems hopeless, no end in sight, a place where you don't understand what God is doing or even if he is there at all. So today I want to take you on a journey with the people of God, the nation of Israel, and their journey through the desert. A time in scripture that contains some of the most amazing stories, as well as some of the most unbelievable missteps by God's people. And I think by looking at their journey through this literal desert, we can gain a better understanding on how to navigate the situations in deserts in our own lives. So this morning I want to preach from the idea, the, the topic, what to do in the desert. What to do in the desert. You can be seated. I want to give special honor this morning to a dear friend of mine. If you don't mind standing, I don't want to embarrass you, but Coach Turner, could you just stand just for a moment? <laughs> Coach Turner is from CE King. And just stay standing, Coach, because I got, I got to take a second here. And this man has been absolutely instrumental in my role in C.E. King. And let me just tell you something, just to boil it down to this. Me, a preacher of the gospel, has the opportunity to go into this year, this is something new we're doing, into the junior high scheduled P.E. class and speak to junior high football students in school about how to be a man of character, about how to be a man of God in a scheduled school time, not, not in a back room somewhere, but during P.E. And God is using this man and many other men to make that happen. And I am thankful this morning that God is giving us favor in our community. And it happens through men like these. Can we just give Coach Turner some thanks? Thank you, Coach. Thank you for letting God use you. Amen. Amen. So Exodus chapter 12, I want to just kind of walk through the book of Exodus, if you'll permit me. We see um, that the, the angel of death is upon Egypt. God has been working this plan to release the Israelites from Egyptian captivity. And the angel of death visits Egypt, and in Exodus 12, 29, the Lord strikes down all the firstborn of Egypt. And this was the last in a series of plagues that God sent to Egypt in order for Pharaoh to release the Israelite people from his grasp. And in Exodus 12, 31, Pharaoh tells Moses, take these people and get out of here. And the Egyptians urged them to go, in fact. So God revolutionized this situation because Israel had been in bondage for 430 years. And now they have been miraculously freed by the power of God. I don't have time to go into it, but you may be familiar with all the stories, the, the many things that God did on behalf of the Israelites to get them to the point where the people that held them captive were pushing them out of the land. Amazing miracle. So they march in faith into the wilderness, and then God leads them, literally leads this nation with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to show them exactly where to walk. Amazing. Exodus 14, God tells Moses what I read. He said, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart, and they're going to pursue you, the Israelites. But that I have planned this whole thing so that my glory May be, may be shown, so camp here. So we see the people and, and the Egyptians are bearing down on them with the, what the Bible says is 600 chariots 
and they're afraid. And, and Moses says, don't worry, watch and see what God is going to do in this moment. And then Moses parts the Red Sea by the power of God and Israel walks through on dry ground. And then that same sea swallows up the Egyptians. And the Bible said that not a single one survived. Absolutely unbelievable story. Unbelievable power of God. Unbelievable demonstration of the power of God in these people. Exodus 15 contains a song written by Moses and the people unto God thanking him for this deliverance. But then later in that chapter we see this in Exodus 15, 24. Then the people complained and turned against Moses. What are we going to drink, they demanded. So Moses cried out to the Lord for help, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood, and Moses threw it into the water and made this water good to drink. You may know this story, the this, this story of the bitter water. And, and then later he says, if you would listen carefully in verse 26, if you would listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, obeying his commands and keeping his decrees, then I will not make you suffer any of the diseases I sent on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So here God gives the, his people a little test in the wilderness. Let's see what you're going to do. The water is bitter. You can't drink it. Let's see how you respond. And the people complain, but God gives them a promise. If you follow after me, if you listen to me. This is an interesting contrast to what we've just seen. The, the attitude of, of the people seems foreign to me, given the information we've just read. It's odd to me that they would resort to complaining then you were just in bondage. You were literally just a slave. What do you have to complain about? It's just, it's a unique and interesting perspective, yet a pattern that we will see emerging in this book. Exodus 16, guess what we see? Another incredible, miraculous move of God, but it also contains complaining, whining, and disobedience. The chapter starts by explaining that they were journeying into the wilderness, and it says it was the 15th day of the second month. In Exodus 16, 2, it says, There too, the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There we sat around with pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. But now you have brought us into the wilderness to starve and all, starve all of us to death. Then God tells Moses, I'm going to rain down food from heaven. Each day, people can go out and pick up as much food as they need. And, and so we, he, you see, he sends quail, and then he sends manna, and he, this, mira this miraculous provision of God every day, they have exactly what they need, no more, no less. And we see that God, again, provides for his people. But they're complaining. I'll give you one guess what happens in Exodus chapter 17. I'll give you one guess the type of situation we find yet again in Exodus 17, verse 2. So once more, you can probably read it without knowing it, the people complained against Moses. Give us water to drink, they demanded. Quiet, Moses replied, why are you complaining against me and why are you testing the Lord? But tormented by first they can, thirst, they continued to argue with Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Are you trying to kill us, our children, our livestock with thirst? Interesting. Why did you, now they're saying, why did you bring us out of Egypt? Why did you bring us here? Then Moses cried out, what do I do with these people? They're ready to stone me. And God again performs a miracle. We see he brings water out of a rock, strike the rock, and water comes out. And of course, everyone, yay, this is great. We're all happy. Later in that same chapter, the Amalekites attack and Israel defeats them. This is the famous story of as long as Moses' hands were held up by Aaron and Hur, the Israelites prevailed. Yet again, we see that victory after victory, and Moses builds a monument, an altar to this place called Yahweh Nisi, meaning the Lord is my banner. These amazing stories, these, these awe-inspiring, faith-building, incredible moves of God time and time and time again. So why do the people always come back with this question, why did you bring us out of Egypt? If I was able to rewind, we see that long before this chapter in this book, God has promised them incredible things. God has promised them a land of plenty. God has many promises in store for Israel, so they know what God has in store. So what's going on? Exodus 19, God speaks to Moses on a mountain, and he says, Moses, you know I'm powerful, you saw what I did to the Egyptians. But if you obey me, keep my commandments, keep my covenant, I will make this nation a special people. 
God is just sowing promise after promise, after promise, after purpose, after future, declarations. He's giving them identity. He's doing all these things every, every time we see God do a work. Not only does he do a work, but he gives them a promise. If you keep my commandments, I'll make you a special people. If you follow my word, I'll do this. God is just literally sowing promise after promise into these people. Moses tells the people, and they say, we'll do everything God asks of us. Moses tells God, he responds, the people will, will follow you. God says, okay, and God brings Moses up, up on the mountain. And I don't have time to read the exact passages, but we see this incredible thing that God speaks from the mountain. He gives commandments on how to live, and people see the power of God through lightning and thunder. And they, they say, Moses, you speak to God, because if God speaks to us, we will die. That's how powerful they saw God as. God gives Moses instruction uh, on how to, how to build altars. He says, don't make idols of silver or gold. Don't do this or that. And Exodus 21, 22, and 23 contain more instruction on every aspect of life. And God is giving him all of this instruction. And then Exodus 24, God calls Moses up on the mountain. He receives the tablets of stone that God had inscribed the commandments. Incredible, miraculous moves of God. The glory of the Lord appears upon the mountain summit like a consuming fire and Moses disappears into the cloud as he climbed higher and higher and the Bible said that he remained there for 40 days and 40 nights. And if you read Exodus 25 through 31, these chapters contain all these guidelines and plans, plans for the tabernacle, plans to house the presence of God, all of these things, plans for the courtyard, the burnt offering, what the priests are to wear, all of these instructions, God is just pouring knowledge and future and plan and all of these things that Israel needs, God is just pouring into Moses. So if we look at this, and I've moved quickly, but if we look at this tapestry of what's happening with, e with the Israelites, they, they have been pulled out of Egypt miraculously saved by no hand of their own. They've crossed through the Red Sea, all of these things. And then we come to Exodus 32. Exodus 32, listen to this. When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said, make us gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here in the land of Egypt. Aaron said, take gold from, rings from your ears and your wives and your sons and daughters, bring them to me. Verse 4, Aaron took all the gold, melted it down, molded it to the shape of a calf. When the people saw it, they exclaimed, Oh, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. These are the gods. Aaron saw how excited the people were, so he built an altar in front of the calf. I don't have time to go into this, but the only reason he knew how to build an altar was because God just instructed them a few chapters back. Then he announced, tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. Verse 6, the people got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. After this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking. They indulged in pagan revelry. I, I, I'm, I'm baffled. I, I, I'm in amazement. I, I, I don't understand. I, it doesn't compute. How could this happen? How could they... They get to this point. I've taken the time so that we see this journey that Israel is on. So let me just recap. Supernatural signs, plagues in Egypt to get them out, a pillar of cloud, a pillar of fire, parting the Red Sea, swallowing up the Egyptians, turning bitter waters sweet, quail and manna from the sky, water from a rock, the amazing defeat of the Amalekites, God's mighty power on the mountain, God talking to Moses in the mountain like a consuming fire. Am I missing something? I, I think, you know, I would dare to say, and I don't claim to be the most amazing man of God ever, but I think if one of these things happened to me, I, feel, I would like to say, that's a lifetime of stuff, God, I, I'm good. If, if a pillar of fire appeared next to me, I would say, that's it. I don't got to preach another message. If you don't believe, <laughs> hello. Yeah. Right? That's, that's, the way we, that's the way we think. So how in the world, after all that, could they possibly turn away from God? What on earth would cause them to act this way? What would make them do this in the desert? 
And as I studied this, I came to this realization that brought such clarity to the entire plight of the Israelite people and resonates so strongly in my life. And I believe so many people in this room. Exodus 15, they complained about what they would drink. 16, they complained and murmured, what would we eat? 17, they complained and murmured about this again. They complained about the manna. They don't want to do what they're instructed. At every turn, they're ungrateful and disobedient, even in the face of the miracles of God, even in spite of the provision of God. Here's the reality. Here's the rub. Here's where we see the biggest difference in the people of Israel. What God meant as preparation, the Israelites saw as punishment. What God intended as preparation, they interpreted and lived out as a punishment. What God designed, orchestrated, and laid out as a preparation for the people of Israel, they never saw as such. No matter what he did, they only saw their desert as punishment. They saw everything through the lens of them being punished by God. So because they saw it as punishment, it didn't matter what God did. You see, God allowed the Egyptians, let me just tell you how amazing each one of these stories are. He allowed the Egyptians to pursue them in chapter 14 and tells Moses, as I read in the beginning, I have planned this myself in order to display my glory through Pharaoh and his whole army. After this, the Egyptians will know that I am God. You know why I love the story of the Red Sea? Because God says to Moses, I I know this attack is coming, Moses. I know your back is against the wall. I know that it's impossible, and that's the whole point. I'm going to allow them to come. In fact, I'm going to allow them to get within an inch of doing you harm. And then, miraculously, I'm going to provide a way of escape that you could never do on your own. I'm going to show up in a miraculous way at the last minute. And and not only that, I'm going to let them chase you. I'm going to let it look like they're going to get you. I'm going to let it look like they're going to catch up with you. I'm going to let them think they can follow you even when you're getting out of the situation. But at the exact moment, I'm going to close that wall up and I'm going to destroy that enemy. You see, God is trying to show Moses, and I think he wants to show somebody today that I may be letting the enemy chase you, but I'm only doing so so I can destroy them once and for all. Because after that time, the Egyptian army never pursued pursued Moses because they were completely destroyed. Somebody needs to understand, you feel like the enemy has been chasing you at every turn? That may be so, but it's all in the plan of God because at the right moment, God will strike. At the right moment, God will close up those waters and that enemy will never bother you again. In fact, some of you right now are living, looking over your shoulder. And everyone knows you can't see where you're going. You can't get any direction if all you're doing is looking over your shoulder. So I just want to pause right now and tell somebody, it's time to stop looking in the rearview mirror. It's time to stop looking over your shoulder at what's chasing you, at what's bothering you. Just forget that. Set your eyes on the the prize. Set your eyes on what is before you and let God do the rest. Let God take care of that enemy. If God has opened the door, walk through it. If God has put you on the path, walk through it. God meant it as preparation, but they only saw punishment. (laughs) Chapter 16, they said, if only God had killed us back in Egypt, at least we had food, food there. Here we're starving. They say we're hungry. Why did you bring us into Egypt, out of Egypt? Are you trying to kill us? God was trying to prepare them and show them that I will provide all your needs. I'm not punishing you. I'm preparing you. But when you have an improper perspective, when you see what God is doing as punishment and not preparation, you will in fact desire that bondage that you came out of. You will look back on the things that change you at one point and you will desire it again. Not because God's not working, not because God's not good, not because God's not able, but simply because you are refusing to see what God is trying to do with you. 
And we see this come to a head in, in chapter 32 to the extreme that the people have completely turned their back on God because they thought they were being punished in the desert. And look at this carefully. It's not because things were bad. It's not because God wasn't doing what he said he would do. He wasn't going back on his word. No, no, no. It simply wasn't because it was taking too long. It was just taking too long. If you don't trust the plans of God fully, the first thing you will begin to distrust is the timeline of God. Because the people knew the promises of God. They knew exactly what was going on. They saw the mountaintop. They saw Moses go up in the mountain. They saw all of these things. But because they saw punishment instead of preparation, they took the timeline into their own hands and ruined everything. Somebody needs to hear this today. We used to sing a song when I was growing up. It said, he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Oh, on-time God, yes, he is. What's the next line? He may not come when you want him, but he will be there right on time because he's an on-time God. The reason you've been messed up is not because God has changed his plans or his mind or your future. It's because you don't want to wait on him. You weren't satisfied with God's timeline. Let me say it this way. You need to stop sacrificing what's right for what's right now. You have got to stop sacrificing what is right for what is right now. Wait on the Lord. What happens to those that wait on the Lord? He renews their strength. If you feel weary, if you're wondering, now is not the time to turn to another source of strength. In fact, the answer is wait on the Lord. Your desert is not punishment. What you are fighting is not punishment from God. It's preparation for the future that God has for you. But if you don't use this time you have now properly, you will not be ready for the blessing that God has prepared for you in the future. Because the people saw everything as punishment and not preparation for their future, they refused to wait on God. So what's the difference between pre pre preparation and punishment? Why did they see punishment, not preparation? Why do we see things this way and how can we avoid it? The missing ingredient is faith. Faith. So simple, yet so powerful. Faith that God knows what he's doing. Faith keeps you dedicated to the course. Faith is so important because we can't see exactly where God is taking us or how he's going to do it. We have to have faith. In other areas of life, preparation is easy to understand and respond accordingly because we see the outcome. Coach T knows this in the lives of the football students. Person on a football team, the team comes to practice and he begins barking orders. Get on the line. We're going to run. We're going to run our drills. We're going to get in the weight room. And if a player sees this as punishment, it's going to affect the way he views every exercise. If it's punishment, I'm just going to do whatever I can just to get by. If it's punishment, then I'm just going to maybe not be the last person out there. If it's punishment, I'm going to be looking at the clock just waiting to see when I can get out of the gym because he thinks it's punishment. But the driven athlete knows that at the end of the week, there's a game. At the end of the game, there's another game. At the end of the season, there's a championship. If he knows the goal, if he knows where he's going, he's not going to see those things as punishment because he's going to realize coach is preparing me for where I'm going. Coach is getting me ready to face what I've got to face. Coach is taking me to the end. With that goal in mind, he now has an undying motivation and an unwavering commitment. It changes everything. And on top of that, even things that feel like punishment, an athlete embraces. Why? Because he knows that that pain is actually strengthening him. That pain is not breaking him. That pain is molding him. In fact, when he, gets, when he gets his mind right, he wants more preparation. When he gets his mind right, he embraces the pain of change because he knows that he's pursuing an outcome set out before him. And that's what we want. We want it to be cut and dry. But that's not the way life is. You don't know where God's taking you next. You can't see the, the, how it's exactly mapped out. But if you have just a little bit of faith, 
You can understand that everything happening in the deserts of your life, everything happening in these difficult circumstances, everything happening in these these seemingly endless moments, God is using as preparation. If you can just have a little infusion of faith this morning, it can revolutionize your spirit. If an athlete gets truly hungry enough for success, if they understand that they're being prepared, guess what they'll do? When Coach T says, okay, guys, that's it. That's it for today. You can stop running and and people around him start collapsing. Do you know what that guy says? He's going to say, coach, give me more. Coach, give me more to do. I I can push myself a little more because he understands something. It's all good. All the work, all the pain, it's all working for his good. All the sweat, all the temporary discomfort, the more he prepares, the more he will win. The more he can push himself with what seems like punishment, the more he can win. What I'm saying is that somebody came in here begging the devil to leave them alone. And I think you need to stand up right now and say, you know what? Bring it on, devil. Why? Because it's all good. Whatever you throw at me, it's not punishment from God. It's preparation. So yeah, let's run a little bit more, okay? Let's go a few more rounds. I'm not backing down. I'm not scared because I know where this is going, and I win. So bring it on. It's all preparation. It's not punishment. It's preparation. Do your worst. You can't do anything to me that God can't turn around for my good. You think you're punishing me, but you're not. You are just preparing me for what's next. 1 Corinthians 9, 25, all athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for a prize that is eternal. We do it for a prize that is incorruptible. We will do it for a prize that will not tarnish or fade away. I believe somebody needs to open the filing cabinet of your memory today and begin relabeling some of your memories. You've got a drawer marked pain and you've placed so many memories in there. I believe you need to rip that label off and write preparation. That bad relationship that you ask God, why are you punishing me? Rewrite on the script of your life, preparation. That job that you lost, that you don't get it and you wrote pain, heartache, hurt, banishment. I need you to rip that off and rewrite preparation because God is getting you ready for what's next. That thing that you thought was a struggle that you'll never get out of, and you'll get out of it because it's preparation. God is not punishing you this morning. He's preparing you. And and, and let me get a little bold with this. Let me get a little bold with the church folks. When you begin to look at things with faith and see preparation and not punishment, It'll change your church life. Guess what? We need Sunday school teachers. Is it fun always? No, it's not always fun. Can kids act up? Sure. Do they? Does it take work? Absolutely. Is it punishment? No, it's not punishment. We're not trying to punish you. We're trying to prepare the next generation to take the gospel of Jesus Christ into this world. If you see church as God's punishment, you won't care, you won't serve, you won't give, and you won't show. But if you understand that what happens here is preparation to get other people to God, if you understand what happens here is preparation for what happens there, then guess what? You'll get here. You'll give here. You'll be here. You'll serve here. You'll pour your talents into this church. Why? Because God's not punishing you. He's preparing you. It's not punishment. It's preparation. Teaching a class on Sunday prepares your children to be dedicated followers of Christ. If you understand that the preparation it takes for your students to learn reaches truth to other people, then you'll understand it's not punishment. It's preparation. Somebody say preparation. You've been speaking punishment over your life long enough. I just want to remove that word from your vocabulary. God is not punishing you. God is not seeking to punish you. God is preparing you. But it's up to you to see it. So after this rebellion, we see Moses comes down and sees this, and he breaks the tablets that contain the Ten Commandments, and the process has to start all over again. Moses goes back up to God, and he begins this again, and we see... 
All 27 chapters of the book of Leviticus contain more preparation and more instruction from God on how they're to live and conduct themselves and receive forgiveness and all these things. We go into the book of Numbers, which contains more information about the roles of the different people of Israel, their responsibility. God is just laying out everything, laying out the roadmap on how to live, what to do, how to succeed, what you need to do. And, and, and there's a moment where, again, people are complaining and the Lord is so angry, he burns the outskirts of the camp. And, and then we come to the next pivotal chapter, Numbers 13. A pivotal chapter in this story. And it's titled, 12 Scouts Explore Canaan. Canaan being the land of promise. The Lord said to Moses, verse 1, Send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I am giving to the Israelites. The land I'm giving you. Send one leader from each of the 12 ancestral tribes. So the men go out and they scout the land and they bring back a report. They say, we entered the land and it is incredible flowing with milk and honey. But the people there are huge. They're giants. We're like grasshoppers to them. Verse 30, skipping down, Caleb, he tries to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. He said, let's go at once and take the land. We can certainly conquer it. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They're stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. Numbers 14, it picks up. The whole community began weeping aloud and they cried all night. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. And we see this again, if only we had died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? And they plotted against themselves. Let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. Here we see the consequences of their action. Again, because in the first verse, God says, I have given you this land. How more clear can God be? But again, all they saw, no matter what God did for them, no matter what God did through them, they continually saw punishment. And when you see punishment and not preparation, you will eventually want to go back to what you came out of. So if you're struggling, if your old life, if your past, if your mistakes are pulling on you with a temptation, with a desire, then maybe you need to readjust your thinking and say, God, I feel like I'm being punished, but that's on me, God, because you are good, because you are great. So it's not punishment, it's preparation. How can they look at their plan of promise, what they've been preparing for? what God has promised to them, what they've been journeying for, how can they look at it now and think there's no way we can conquer it? This is the second thing I realized. The first thing was they saw punishment where God intended preparation. The second thing, since they saw punishment instead of preparation, they saw their desert as a sentence and not a season. They thought their desert was their sentence and not just a season. If they would have understood that the desert was God's preparation, then they would have realized it was only a season of time. It was only a season of their life. But since they perceived their desert as punishment, they resigned themselves to the fact that it was also their sentence. If they could have only seen that it was a season in their life, a season in the time of Israel, they could have learned the lessons that that season offered. They would have taken advantage of that season. They would have realized it's not permanent. I'm not sentenced to this for the rest of my life. I will have what God has promised me. But instead of preparation, they saw punishment. So instead of a season, they saw a sentence. And because of their disobedience and refusal of God's promises over and over again, in fact, by their own hand, it did become their sentence for that generation. And we see the response of God at the end of Numbers 14. He basically says, fine, have it your way. If this is what you want so much, then nobody over the age of 20 will enter into the promised land because you have refused my commandments. You have refused the land that I've given you. The only exceptions will be Caleb and Joshua because they are the two spies that said, we can take this land. 
So what was meant to be a season, what was meant to be preparation, turned into exactly what they thought, punishment and a sentence. Not because of what God did or God's plan or God's will, but in spite of it, their refusal to listen to God resulted in them doing the exact thing they were accusing God of doing. I don't have time to unpack all of this, but somebody right now, today, needs to understand that the desert you find yourself in today is not a life sentence. The place that you feel like you are stuck in forever is just a temporary season. And if you can understand that it's a season, then you can begin to learn some lessons instead of simply accusing God. You need to shift your perspective this morning and say, God, what can I learn in this season? Yes, it may be difficult. Yes, it may be a desert. But God, if you've got some things to teach me, teach me. Because... Why? Because God, I want to be ready for your promises. You're saying, give me promises, give me promises. God says, you're not ready yet. You've got to go through the desert to get to the promise. So somebody needs to backpedal a little bit. And instead of saying, God, give me promises, God, give me promises, maybe say, God, let me learn right here in the desert the things I need to learn to be ready for your promises. Your brokenness is not permanent. What you are going through is not God's punishment, but God's way of preparing you for the future he has in store. God's not punishing you with a sentence. He's preparing you for a season. And on top of that, God is not asking you today, what do you see in your future? He's not asking you, what do you see for yourself? He's not asking you, what what do you see? They didn't send 12 spies because six couldn't see the land. They sent 12 because they wanted to get a consensus on how they saw the land. Because they all saw the same thing. It wasn't about what they saw. It's about how they saw it. They saw giants. They saw insurmountable obstacles. But two of them didn't care. Two of them said, whatever I see literally doesn't matter because I'm walking into the situation with a perspective that no matter what I encounter, God has promised me that I will conquer. So I'm just gonna begin stepping forward into God's promises. You're not stepping into a fight today. You're not stepping into a battle. You're stepping into promise. You don't gotta fight the battle because it's not your battle to fight. God's gonna fight the battle because he's given you the promise. So it doesn't matter what you're facing. It doesn't matter how tough it looks. It's about how you see it. What do you see? Do you see punishment or do you see preparation? Do you see a life sentence or do you see just a season? Somebody needs to understand this because this is at the core of our very being. This isn't something that we clap and then go home and say that was great. No, this is something that you go home and you begin to change some things in your family. You begin to change the way you speak about yourself. You begin to change the way you speak about your future. You may say, I see giants, but say, you know what? That doesn't matter. All the better, because if God wants me to go there, then I will go there. If God has promised it to me, then I will take it. How do you see your future? That's the question. Because God made you. He loves you. He sees you. He's been preparing you. He knows the path you've taken to get where you are. And he's leading you to his promises. Will you stand with me this morning? Preparation, not punishment. And it's a season, not a sentence. This morning, I'm going to appeal to you. I'm going to appeal first to people that feel punished. Condemnation is a strong, strong, strong pull. There's a vast difference between conviction and condemnation. God will convict you, draw you to change, compel you to do better. God will never bring condemnation into your spirit. Jesus Christ died and rose again so that you don't have to feel the condemnation of your sin, but yet you can feel the conviction that draws you to an altar. So this morning there are people in this room that feel punished. You feel like the situations that have come into your life are God's way of punishing you. 
You feel that the, the mistakes you have made are still punishing you today. You feel punished. Maybe emotionally, mentally, physically. You just feel beaten down, weary. And your response is to question. I hate to say it, but like the Israelites, why did you bring me here? God, why did you bring me to this desert? At least I had food to eat back there. At least in my broken situation, I, I was happy some days, but now I just feel nothing. You need to shift your perspective this morning. God's not punishing you. God is preparing you for what comes next. I know you want the promises, but it's going to take a journey. You have to walk through the desert to get to where God is taking you because you just can't walk out of bondage into promise. You're not ready. You haven't seen God. You haven't seen his power. You haven't seen him pull you through time and time again. There's a reason Israel had to go through a desert. They couldn't walk out of Egypt into Canaan. It's not just geography. It's God's plan. And somebody this morning, because of that perceived punishment, you have abandoned the timeline of God. And you said, I'll do this my way. I'll take things into my own hands. I don't feel God's presence, so I'm going to fix up my own thing. That's the worst thing you can do. The Israelites, they failed because they didn't want to wait. And I'm sorry that waiting is a part of our life. I'm sorry that waiting is a part of, of, of the plan of God. It's not fun for anyone, but you need to just wait. Just wait on God. Wait on God because he's preparing you. He's not punishing you. So I'm appealing to people that maybe you have messed up God's timeline. Maybe you have got some things out of order. But guess what? We serve a God that can take all of the pieces and realign them in a way that you could never imagine. And in fact, all the things that the enemy has been using to break you, God is saying, I will prepare you. I said it at the very outset. There's no weapon formed against us that shall prosper. So you may feel like you have been taking a beating from the devil from every angle. But yet God says that weapon is actually you useless. He feels like he was chopping you down. He was actually just helping me carve you into exactly what I wanted you to be. I've been preparing you this whole time. Please just see it. I'm not, I'm not telling you God's going to change. I'm going to tell you that you need to change. We need to change. We need to see what God sees. We need to understand what God is speaking into our life. And this morning I'm reaching out to people who feel like you are serving a sentence for your mistakes. You feel like, I deserve this. I deserve this punishment because I did it. I'm serving the sentence of my consequences. I'm serving the sentence of other people's consequences. Or maybe you don't feel like you deserve it. I'm serving the sentence. I got laid off at my job. My marriage is in shambles. I'm serving this sentence. What is happening? And I need you, if you, ha if you find yourself in that position this morning, please, you have to realign your thinking like the people of Israel. Only a few were able to do it. But if you can realign your thinking and understand that I'm not serving a life sentence because God can reach me wherever I am. This is not a sentence. This is a season. And when you see it as a season, then you'll understand it has an ending. And when you understand it has an ending, you'll say, God, teach me whatever I can learn in this season because I'm about to be out of this season. So let me learn what I can learn now so I'm ready for what happens next. It's not punishment. It's not, it's preparation. And it's not a life sentence. It's just a season. God is going to bring you through. God is going to bring you through. If you are being pursued by your enemy, <laughs> I believe that God is looking as he told Moses, I've planned this all along. You may hate what's going on in your life. That's the strongest word I can use. But I believe God wants to peel back the layers of heaven and speak to us this morning and say, I have been planning this all along. I know you're frustrated. I know you're angry, I know you feel punished, but I have been preparing you for an amazing and beautiful future. And guess what, I believe this morning, all it takes is a shift in your perspective to bring you out of this season. I believe that there is somebody here today that God has put all of the pieces in place. He has just been waiting on you to see it for yourself. And so with your shift in perspective, if you can look back at God and say, okay, God, this is not punishment. This is preparation. Okay, God, this is not a forever thing. Maybe this is only a season. I believe God is going to say, yes, that's what I was waiting on. I've got promises laden up for you. I've got 
got promises in store and now that you see it the way I need you to see it, I'm ready to drop them on you. Is anybody ready to receive some promises from God? If you are ready to receive promises, I am opening these altars for you this morning. Would you come now and say, God, that's me. It's not for anybody else. Lord, it's for me. Would you come right now? and have a shift in your perspective that God I may not see the way you're working but I know that you're working I may feel punished but you are preparing me and God this is not forever I will come out of this this is just a season oh can we raise our hands and worship right now and pray Lord I pray right now that you would confirm your word in the hearts and lives of your people thanks for watching this video if it has blessed you in any way consider subscribing to our YouTube channel by clicking the button to your right also, if you'd like to partner with Royalwood Church to reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, click the Give Now button to your right as well. Thank you so much for watching, and God bless.